we got Liz for Bud Light, so she's good over there, right? Um, and uh, uh, they're going to talk for a bit and take some questions. Um, just as a grassroots organizer, I was asked just to say why I support Pete. Um, I'm sure all of us have reasons. The fundamental reason I support him is because I trust him. I trust him as a veteran, someone on foreign policy who's carried a weapon and knows that they shouldn't be on our streets. I trust him as a young person who is, has a vested interest in climate change in the decades ahead for him and his family. I trust him as someone who struggled with his family with college affordability and student loan debt, someone who's been there and done that and struggled with it. And so um, I trust that he is the candidate that we all need in 2020. And so there's that. With that, let's welcome uh, Liz Smith and Mike. <laughs> extremely outdoor voice so um, if the mic is like getting weird or annoying um, so oh my god thank you guys so much for turning out um, and I'm um, just like really excited to be here with Mike as well uh, you know I'm from New York Mike is from South Bend we're here with a big Philly crowd and you know we probably don't agree on everything in life um, but I think we all agree that there is a big existential threat that we face that needs to be defeated, and that is why I want to thank Philadelphia for destroying the Patriots this last weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, they did. Um, God, and that was painful too. I was, I had a, I do a lot of fantasy football, and I was coasting. And then I, the only player left in my opponent's roster was Zach Ertz, and I was like, well, you know, a tight end's not going to get 22 points. Well, yeah, you learn. Um, but so thank you for your service for that. Um, and you know, speaking of existential threats. Um, Let's talk about this election and, and what's at stake here. Um, and I don't want to speak for too long up front, but so what I do for Pete is I am his senior advisor on communications. I first met Pete about um, three years ago. How do you sit on this? Like a skirt, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, about three years ago, and. Uh, when he was running for DNC chair. And I remember being introduced, introduced to him and finally meeting him in person. Um, and I set him up with a couple, a few national interviews. And during the second national interview, I remember the reporter looking at me during the interview and just going, oh my God. <laughs> and uh, we left it and I felt it, there in that moment too, which is that the thing I've always heard about in politics, the thing I had always wanted to feel, and which is like, where has this person been my entire life? That this is the person um, that, and I, I don't want to overplay it, but I just never seen anyone like him. His demeanor, his composure, his maturity, but also the clarity of his values and his beliefs and how he thought about things. And like, at a time, right after Trump lost, Trump won, you know, <laughs> after we... <laughs> right. But at a time, right after we lost to Trump, there was this idea that the only way to beat Trump was to become Trump. Um, was to fight fire with fire, uh, was to get down in the mud with him. And what Pete was offering was something that, you know, the media wasn't looking for, the, um, a lot of the voters didn't know that they were looking for, but it cut through the noise. And there was something special about it and um, kept working for him, doing all that. And um, Mike and I ended up together and Mike will tell his story, but, um, you know, this campaign started out with three people in a row. Uh, the 
day before his exploratory committee, it was Mike, Pete, and me. Um, and so whenever people tell you that this is a consultant-driven campaign, uh, <laughs> you know, generally when you launch a presidential campaign, you got a cast of thousands. Um, and, but I think it speaks to how special this campaign is, how special Pete is, um, which is that there wasn't a lot of filter, there wasn't a lot of BS, there wasn't a lot of the smoke and mirrors. Um, and what we did is understanding, we understood that we didn't have a ton of money. We had zero name ID. I mean, the guy's last name was Buttigieg, okay? Like, um, but we had the same access to free media that everyone else did. Um, and we had a guy who is such an amazing communicator, knows what he believes, is so beyond comfortable in his skin, and to the point where we could put him anywhere. Uh, we put him on um, entertainment shows, fashion shows, well, not fashion shows, but like, you know, uh, outlets. Um, connect them with sports calmness, and you know, what, when you think about like celebrity, fashion, sports, sort of the last thing that comes to mind is Pete Buttigieg. Um, but it, it, it does speak to why he's been successful in this, because he can go out anywhere with fearlessness, with clarity, and speak to anyone. And even when he's speaking to a sports outlet, he's not going out there and trying to pretend that you know he knows who the tight end of the Eagles is. I mean, I do, because I lost to him, but... Um, and, and that was the thing. It's so it was just like our strategy from the beginning was let people hear from Pete um, because he's so different. Get him out there. And we sort of had been building this thing. And, and I, I'm looking around this room and I know that a lot of you guys were in fairly early. Um, so by the time we hit the CNN town hall, took off like a rocket ship. Um, immediately we hit enough donors to uh, qualify for the debates. Uh, and keep in mind that we had started this campaign with an email list of like 24, 27,000 um, people on the list uh, and a goal of raising $1 million in the first quarter. And of course, in the second quarter, we raised $24.8 million. So, <laughs> um, and now, so now this is where we are. So you, I think a lot of you are familiar with the journey. We just had to get people to know Peep. Then we had to make sure that we had the infrastructure, the resources to get the word out. And thank you so much from the bottom of my heart to everyone in this room that helped with that. And, and that helped with the resources, but that is now doing the, the work that we need, which is to get the word out about Pete. Um, and now this is the phase that we're in. And it, it's almost improbable sometimes to Mike and me. Um, sitting back in that like little doctor's, it was like, uh, it's like that to, to here, like this little, it had like uneven floors, rented furniture, hot spots because the Wi-Fi didn't work. Um, and that was how we launched the presidential campaign. Uh, and now we're in the top four. Uh, and now we are uh, number one, number two, and I don't like to talk about polls, but since we're among friends, um, number one, number two in the uh, polling averages in Iowa and New Hampshire, and it's wild. Um, but why it's wild is not because of what other people say sometimes that um, somehow he's a media-created candidate or corporate, this, that. He's there because he is tapping into something that the American people haven't had tapped into in, in decades, right? He is doing something completely different, speaking differently, thinking differently, respecting pe people differently, and, and just, campaigning differently in a, 
than anyone I've seen in my lifetime. He doesn't, um, you know, perform. He doesn't go out there and try to yell and scream for the cameras. He doesn't go out there and say things he doesn't believe. Um, let me give you a great example of this. Is uh, and then I'll, I'll move to Mike. But I, I do want to pause for this. Is so last week, um, Pete was under pressure to uh, get out of his NDA for McKinsey, and. Everyone from elected officials to reporters, commentators, they were saying, just break the NDA. And you know, Pete made the point that I am a man of my word. I signed a document. And when I give my word, it means something. I understand it's not politically convenient. Um, and I understand I'm going to take heat for this, but I want to do the right thing before I break my word. And you know what? Sure enough, on Monday, McKinsey let him get out of that. And he managed to both keep his word and be extremely transparent with the American people. And the fact that he kept his word and withstood all this pressure is why I believe that this man has the character, on top of everything else, to be president of the United States. Um, <laughs> So there's going to be a lot going on. I, you know, it's been a busy week. Our opponents are getting a little chippy with us, um, and that's okay. When people are talking about you, it means you're doing well. Um, and all the time they spend talking about you is time that they're not talking about themselves. Um, and so we have to deal with these things, and we got to deal with it. And Look, we will make contrast, but that's not, that's not what our focus is here. We didn't get here by yelling, screaming, by being chippy, by doing any of that stuff. We got here by showing the American people what, who Pete is, uh, what his values are, what he believes in, um, what he stands for, what he's going to do to help us pick up the pieces the day after this president leaves office. Um, and that is going to be our focus. Uh, but. Let's not be under any illusions about how tough some of these days are, ahead are going to be. Um, but I know Pete. I love Pete. I've, it is the honor of my life to get to work for Pete. Um, and I know he will make everyone, he, he makes me proud every day. He'll make everyone here proud every day. And he will restore the sort of dignity, respect, the civility, the just honor that has been lacking in the highest office in this land. And don't ever think for a second that we don't understand that all of you helped us get, that, get here and that he doesn't understand that. And we are gonna work every day, not just to win over the American people, but to make you proud because you are the lifeblood of this campaign and our supporters and everything you do, I, I, I will put Pete's supporters up against any supporters in this race. The kindness, respect, affection, the things I see you guys do for each other, not just for Pete, it, it, it touches me and it touches this entire community and this is not just about Pete. It is about this community, and it is about what we are trying to build here, which is it's not just about a personality. It is not just about Pete. It is about a new culture that we need to bring to this country that is so lacking that we care about each other, that we don't rip each other down, that, that in the toughest moments, whether or not you know we disagree on this or work at different places, that we are there for each other. And so thank you, guys. Thank you. And I want to make you guys proud. You know, so I do this stuff for Pete, but, and it's tough in a campaign, right? There's a lot of, um, generally when you run for president, like, you surround yourself with all these super serious, you know, men and women who are like, you, I mean, let's be real, usually not, who are like, I'm so smart, I've been on, you know, presidential campaigns for 20 years, and everything about you needs to change. You need to wear a suit jacket, you know? 
Uh, <laughs> you know what we didn't do? That. <laughs> um, but part of the reason why this campaign is saved true to Pete um, is because of Mike. Uh, Mike is a heart and soul of this campaign. Mike is there every day to make sure, one, that, you know, Pete never gets too big for his friendships. <laughs> not that, you know, and that's not really an issue with Pete, let's be real, like, that's not an arrogant guy. But he's also there just to make sure that the, this campaign somewhat reflects the Pete that he's always known. And that we never get tugged into this DC sort of uh, warfare and this political warfare. And, and, and I gotta tell you guys, I wanna be honest with you, we're not always gonna get it right. But to the extent that we get it right, to the extent that we are here, it is because of Mike. Um, and I'm thrilled to work with him and to have him by my side as my, also he's, I mean, he's my boss, so. Um, <laughs> but, but to have him in this effort and, and you know, Mike is as integral a part of this campaign and this movement as anyone outside of Pete. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Mike. Thank you, Liz. Good evening, everybody. I have a Trulies here, which means that I can answer all your questions truthfully, I think. <laughs> so Liz has her outdoor voice, and the staff always tells me that I sound like an NPR host. <laughs> My goal is to keep you all awake for the next hour. Um, but it's great to be with all of you, and um, Liz Smith, um, it's hard to put into words what she's done for this campaign. Um, there are two people at the top of this campaign who have no modern presidential campaign experience. Me and Mayor Pete. <laughs> and so, <laughs> true, truly. Um, <laughs> and we have surrounded ourselves with the best in the business and Liz Smith is the best in the business at what she does. And so another round of applause for her. <laughs> I also want to um, recognize the space that we're in, um, uh, LGBTQ Community Center, and the historic nature of Pete's candidacy. Um, we opened um, South Bend's first LGBTQ resource center when Pete was mayor. Um, and I just want to thank everybody who came to this space and made it available for us. Um, I think we should acknowledge the historic nature of Pete's candidacy as well tonight. Yeah. So I am uh, born and raised in South Bend, Indiana, and I went to Notre Dame. I have a red beard. I was not the leprechaun <laughs> at Notre Dame. People often ask me that. Uh, and I met Pete in eighth grade for a tour of our high school. Uh, you can't believe that. So if there are young people here, be nice to your classmates in high school and college. You never know what they will do, <laughs> or if you'll work for them later on in life. Um, um, Pete's dad and my dad were actually uh, faculty members at Notre Dame. That's why we grew up in South Bend. Uh, and so I showed up for the tour, and short guy, shy, pudgy, bookish, just like me back then, 1997. What's up? And it was a very quiet tour. Uh, um, like, there's a lockers. Cool, thanks. You know, there's the basketball gym, all right, cool, yeah. Um, but Pete and I became friends, and we stayed in touch over the years. And we both uh, moved home to get involved in politics around the same time, in 2009. And so, actually, separately, I worked for our congressman, and Pete moved home to run for state treasurer of Indiana. Um, fun fact, side note, I just thought of this. One of the debates, a couple of debates ago, I asked Pete, like, how you doing, man? And he's like, well, nine years ago, I was a failed Indiana state treasurer candidate, and tomorrow I'm standing next to Joe Biden. So I was like, yeah, you're doing pretty good, man. 
nice. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, we moved home, South Bend. Um, and, uh, and Pete put his, put his uh, hat in the ring to run for mayor. And at that time, uh, Newsweek and other places were saying South Bend was a dying city. It was losing its young people. And Pete and I were sitting there saying, well, we live in South Bend, we're young. Um, and we rolled up our sleeves and, and got to work and he ran for mayor and became our mayor. And it's a little bittersweet because January 1st, 2020, he leaves office. And so he's done with his two terms as our mayor. Um, and I often tell people that the biggest impact that he's made in our community is actually not physical. That it's, um, it's a belief and a pride in the city, again. And um, I think our country needs that. I think regardless of policy, regardless of where you stand on the issues and fighting and TV and online and the internet and all that stuff, is that Americans want to feel like uh, we believe again in our country and that we can, we can talk to each other and listen to each other and engage with each other and it's not constantly fatiguing or tiring or exhausting. Um, and that's the legacy he's leaving and it's really powerful. Our community that we grew up in is completely different now. Uh, and you see it in the, in the faces of people um, when you walk around downtown. And it's really cool because our campaign's so big that there's boot edge edge t-shirts like everywhere. <laughs> and so like cafes and bars and restaurants and coffee shops are just packed with Pete uh, campaign workers and, and Pete supporters. Um, and Liz hinted at this, it's been a long year. It's been an awesome year. So January, 2019, very cold, our humble offices, uh, Pete for America Exploratory Committee. We were about four or five people, and that was in January. The last month of the year, and right now, December, I can report to you that we are over 500 full-time staff across mm -hmm. the country. Yeah. Liz just said I'm doing good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, pal. Um, and we had zero dollars in the bank and a total leap of faith. And in the last financial reporting period, if you take out Senate transfers from, from some of our competitors, from their Senate bids to their presidential bids, we are the number two fundraiser in the entire Democratic field. That is remarkable. And and we are, we are number two just behind Bernie Sanders, who has a massive sort of grassroots following and, and a number of contributors across the country. Um, Liz said one of our first goals was getting 65,000 donors. We now have over 700,000 donors across the country, which is fantastic. And we are working, we're really, really close at the moment to getting um, two million contributions total, which is a great indicator for our campaign to go from you know, that, that, that one goal to get on the first debate stage to getting two million unique contri or two million contributions total would just be fantastic. And so we are really, really close, and I think in the next couple of days we're gonna hit that mark. Um, in the third quarter at the beginning, we actually had zero field offices across the country. We ended the third quarter with 55 field offices <laughs> in the United States. Uh, we now have about 70 field offices in Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. Um, and it, it's emotional to go in these spaces because our exploratory committee office was so small. <laughs> and now I go to these, these like beautiful field offices that are like painted and like the rules of the road are on the wall and like people are coming in and dropping off food and snacks and people are coming there and they're building a community uh, in those small towns and those hamlets in Iowa and New Hampshire. Um, so it's, it's, it's been an incredible year and I just wanna say thank you for all that you have done uh, here in, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and other states uh, nearby to build our community. Um, also on the campaign, we're talking about big things that only really three other campaigns are talking about. Not just getting to the Iowa caucuses, but through the Iowa caucuses and what's after that. Um, and that's really uh, the top four candidates, Joe Biden, us, Elizabeth Warren, and Bernie Sanders. There are really only four campaigns right now that are planning and gaming all of that out. Um, but we have, as we know, the candidate, we have the message, we have the team, we have the resources, we have the game plan to go the distance. And I believe that we can do it. I really, really do. Um, and I'll end with this. Um, 
I have known Pete for, for quite a long time, majority of my life, and he is the most courageous person that I know. Is that when you put your name on the ballot and run for office, that's an act of courage. When you sign up and decide to serve your military overseas, that is an act of courage. When you come out to your constituents in the middle of a re-election year, and a guy named Mike Pence is the governor of the state, that is an act of courage. And when you decide to run for president of the United States to become the youngest president in our nation's history, that is an act of courage. And we need more courage in our country right now. We really, really do. Liz says she's stealing that. <laughs> but I'll end with this, and I tell the team this a lot every, every week, is that um, it is tough out there, it is sometimes negative, it is sometimes a race to the bottom online, um, it can be exhausting and fatiguing talking about politics. I believe that we can change the style of our politics through our campaign. Um, and I also think that we are in a tremendous place to be where we are in Iowa and New Hampshire and what comes after that. Uh, and that we are not witnesses, not only witnesses to history, but we are participants in history. And we can change what is happening in this country. We can secure the Democratic nomination and we can beat this president. I truly believe that. Um, and you're a really, really big part of that. So thank you for coming out tonight. And Liz and I look forward to chatting with you the rest of the evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So we're doing questions. Claire, Rock, in the house. Uh, yes, 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 got it. All right, who wants to ask a question? Sir, yeah, go for it. Can you clarify to me what uh, your campaign is doing to persuade Afro-Americans? Yep. Everybody? <laughs> Absolutely. So one of, our, one of our major goals on the campaign, if not one of the biggest ones, is diversifying our coalition. That we know in order to secure the nomination and to build a coalition, not just to beat Trump, but for a new era in American politics, we have to bring everybody along with us. Um, and so there's a bunch of things we're doing. Uh, number one is more peat time with communities of color. There's one candidate in this race who has really, really big African-American support, and that's Joe Biden. Um, and there's a real big cliff to everybody else. And so Joe Biden's been in public life for 44 years. People have just sort of been on the scene like not that long. And so <laughs> <laughs> we're playing a lot of catch up. We're really playing a lot of catch up. And Pete's gonna spend more quality time and quantity time with communities of color. Um, African-American and Latino across the country. So that is, that is a given. Um, it's investment, too. We've invested heavily in Iowa and New Hampshire, and look what you see. Pete's doing really, really well, and people know who he is. Um, you go outside those states, and his name ID really drops off. He's really unknown. And so uh, we just announced the biggest investment in the field, minus Tom Steyer, He's, he's a wealthy guy um, in the Democratic field. And so of all of our competitors of that, of that four, we've invested over $2 million in South Carolina. So that's radio, television, digital ads. People will get to see Pete, hear Pete, meet Pete. That'll be really critical. It's our staff, too. A lot of people don't realize that we are 40% um, people of color at Pete for America. We are majority women. We are 40% people of color. We want to build a, a campaign team that represents not America as it is now, but America as it will be in the future. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're going to start to, and some people have probably seen this online, is we're going to start to leverage South Bend voices, South Bend stories. Yeah. We've had to wait a little bit because Pete um, is leaving office, and a lot of people wanted to wait until he was no longer kind of the mayor to get involved in politics. And it's, it's a heavy thing to, to tell South Benders, like, the New York Times is here to talk to you. It's like, <laughs> that's kind of stressful for, for some people. And so, so what we've done is we've brought a lot of those self Bend voices with us to tell their story of Pete. They've known him before, during, and they'll know him after his time as our mayor. And so getting those people to do videos online, op-eds, travel with him to different communities around the country, I think will be really powerful. 
and they'll and then and then voters will get to hear from people who know him best um, on any issue. And I think that that'll start to tick up our numbers. And the last thing I'll say, you can tell I'm thinking about this a lot, is winning solves a lot of your problems. Yeah. <laughs> so just like sports, just like anything else, if Pete Buttigieg wins Iowa, if he wins, when he wins Iowa, yeah. when he wins Iowa. <laughs> People are gonna wake up on February 4th and be like, who's this Pete Buttigieg guy? And how do you beat all these well-known politicians? And that'll be a big game change for our campaign. To follow Sorry. up on the African-American theme, yeah. is the campaign aware of the similarities between Pete's message and Jesse Jackson in 84 and 88 oh. when he ran for president? Yeah, no, you got this. Wow. Yeah, you like Jesse? <laughs> yeah. I, I do like Jesse Jackson. <laughs> so my first did, political... Did <laughs> Did you plant this question? It's been in my mind for some time. So the question was um, the similarities between Pete's message and Jesse Jackson's message when he ran for president in 1988. 84 and 88. 84 and 88. So Jesse Jackson is actually my first political memory, which is actually kind of cool. Not many people know that. I think you know that. Yeah, and that's about yeah. it. Is that in 1988, I was five. I would run around the house and just chant Jesse at the TV because he was my guy, he's my candidate. Back then. So that's that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> but um, I think the message—I mean, our message is is really resonating. Our message is is, um, and Liz can speak more to this in detail, but. It is, it is being bold and being progressive, but also being unifying. Is that, is that, and that bringing people along with us, that, that we've talked a little bit about the polarization and the fatigue out there in our politics. Imagine the day after Donald Trump leaves office and, and what we are gonna have to do to repair this country and bring people with us. And I think that that's, that's really important. Yeah. Jesse liked to use the phrase common ground. Yeah, yeah, common ground, yeah. And just and one thing I would say on that is, think about how hard it is to find the common ground today. Just not even politics, but when you're at dinner with friends, when you're in a conversation, when um, uh, you know when you're on the subway, uh, when when you're making small talk, and it's almost like the common ground doesn't exist anymore. And I think it's. Because, I don't want to put it all on Washington, but I, I'll put like a, most of it on Washington. But um, in, in terms of politics is that there's this idea that's a zero sum game, right? And that a victory is a victory, even if you don't win, but if you defeat the other side. Um, and that like a 40% victory for our side is a loss. And that anyone who has ever voted for a Republican in their life is disqualified. Anyone who's ever worked for a certain company in their life is disqualified. Um, and I do think it's time for a paradigm shift on this. And the, finding the common ground, because I, I can't remember the last time people found common ground in Washington. And I, honestly, I don't even remember it, like just in society anymore. Um, and let's be clear, you know, Pete gets criticized for this. He gets criticized for welcoming, um, you know, what he likes to call future former Republicans to his events. Um, right. And, and so you, so let's, let's talk about you for a second. <laughs> so... So, <laughs> try to think about it. So, given the partisan atmosphere, the fact that you had been a registered Republican, maybe you are still, all this, that, that disqualifies you. That, that makes, that associates you with all the worst qualities that have ever been associated with the Republican Party. And let's not be clear Donald Trump is a racist, misogynist, um, authoritarian, you know, leaning um, sociopath, right? <laughs> Um, so, not I'm not here defending that, but it is possible. It it is possible to 
change people's minds. And it is possible that maybe life isn't all about people being in categories of good people and bad people, and maybe that their party registration should do that. And it seems controversial sometimes when Pete says that. Um, but we're not going to change this country. We're not going to uh, address the challenges we face. We are not, we're not gonna win this election, we're not gonna change politics, unless we bring as many people into the fold as possible. Um, and it's not gonna be all people who agree with us, all of that, but there has to be some sort of understanding about, about each other. And we're not gonna exclude people. Um, you know, Pete's campaign is about belonging. And if you want to join this cause, to defeat Donald Trump, to defeat everything he believes in, to defeat his coward enablers in Congress, then you know what? I don't care if you're a Republican. Welcome to our fucking side, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So the question is, so how does he kind of stay calm, yeah, even he's keel? Still like a sense of urgency. Like he still has that urgency. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, he's he's very even keel. He's very calm. I think that underneath it all, there's like a I think a quiet intensity to Pete. Uh, he's very competitive. He, he, he's quietly very intense. But I think that um, from that day I met him till now, he's really the same person. I mean, he's he's very empathetic. Um, he's not only very smart and very gifted, but he has also a high emotional, I think, um, intelligence. Um, he is a very strong listener. I'd say probably one of, the, one of the best listeners that I know. And I think that that's how he unlocks a lot of people, is he, he has an easy way about him, and he's able to ask questions and, and listen uh, very deeply to kind of come to a solution. Um, and. The, the, the most powerful, I mean, one of the more powerful things about Pete is he's not going to say something different to two different audiences. He's going to say the same thing to both. And I think that's really important because a lot of people in, in politics will go to the labor hall and be like, workers unite. And then they'll go to the chamber of commerce and be like, let's build two big buildings, you know? And like, they won't bring the two together. And I think that Pete's able to do that every day in a lot of different ways. Yeah, and, and well, you know, I'll just say this, the obvious, which is my demeanor is a little bit different from Pete's, you know? <laughs> um, and and I, I've wondered about that a lot, but to me it's one of the most impressive qualities about him, um, is his ability to keep his cool, calm, collected demeanor. Because um, sometimes you see, you see these politicians out there, and they they go, and everyone can read through that the the fake phoniness. Um, but you know, I travel with him sometimes, and I'll be on these uh, rope lines or, or where he's like taking selfies with people, and you know, the people who come up to him and tell him their stories. 
heard stories from, you know, 13 uh, year old transgender girls uh, to in the most conservative, conservative counties in Iowa, like 80 year old men who've never come out in their lives, just openly weeping in front of him. And so, and how he connects with them. And so, yeah, it's, he's not doing the, the I feel, but he feels it, he does. Um, and I, and maybe I think that like a politician that's not performative about these things, that actually feels these things and doesn't feel the need to, and everyone's different, right? Everyone's different, but the one thing that really annoys me is when I hear people say, you know, that he's not empathic or that he's not emotional because I see the things and the conversations he has and I don't know how I'd be able to keep it together when he does it. Um, and um, there is a quiet intensity to him, and but the empathy is there, and he is like always there, talking to people and like connecting with people, and and um, I'm, I'm just trying to to stick this landing here, but um, <laughs> but doing it in a way that isn't performative, that's not there for the cameras, that's not there for this, that. And I think it means a lot more to people when he just looks in their eyes and, and talks to them and, and away from all of that and says what he believes. Because this is someone who has been through a lot in his life and has um, had to hide a lot of things in his life. And I think it comes through in his personal conversations. I think his intensity does come through in this stuff. Um, and I think this idea that the only way to be a public official or be, be a politician is to, you know, yell, scream, cry, emote, all that. No, I mean, we have that in the current president, okay? And maybe it, it's good just to have someone who knows who they are, comfortable in their skin, really feel for other people but don't feel the need to, to publicly display it um, in an act of like trying to get political credit. We have time for one more question. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was the uh, one moment, was me? Yeah. <laughs> what was the uh, one moment on the trail where you really felt, oh yeah, we're gonna win this. What was the one moment for you? Was it a conversation with Pete, or was it like walking into an arena, hearing supporters? What was it? <laughs> um, so, well, I've had a few of these, but I remember it was, so the announcement was dope. That was dope, right? <laughs> um, so we did, I don't know if you guys have followed, we do these open bus these open press bus tours, right? And no other candidate ever does that because they're terrified of the media. Um, and they don't want to be transparent. They don't trust their candidates to answer the questions. That's not me going negative. That's just me talking about candidates generally. Like Senate candidates don't do that either. Um, and, you know, first of all, the fact that, we, that, you, that you and Pete agreed to this is like, I mean, you might just to get your head checked, you know? <laughs> Um, but so we do these open tour, open press bus tours. Um, and that in itself is very weird because generally, you know, day in the life of a politician, presidential candidate, at most they will talk 10 minutes to the press. And it's rapid fire of 10 different outlets throwing questions at them. When they're on the bus, it's just like 15 reporters, anything. And some of these legs are like two and a half hours. Um, and it gets really deep. Sometimes it gets really weird. Um, but I remember uh, on the third, so we did a bus tour in Iowa. Then we did another one in Iowa again. The first one in Iowa was before Pete had taken off in the polls. The second one was when we'd seen the growth. And that's when a lot of campaigns would be like, no, 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 no you know, Rose Garden strategy, don't let him talk to the press. But of course, you know, we threw him right into it. Um, and so we did four days there. And then, and, and it was wild. 
the reaction to him there was something different from what I'd seen before, which is where it went from people being curious to seeing him to people being like, hell yes, this is my guy. Iowa is a very different flavor of politics from New Hampshire. Um, I have family from New Hampshire, family that was in elected politics in New Hampshire, very different flavor. And I remember then we went to New Hampshire and the first time I really, really felt this, it was, it was then, it was in um, early November, it was in late October, early November, and I remember it was just this absent, like 1,500 people packed into this gym in a small town in New Hampshire, and New Hampshire's not like a raw, raw, ideological, like liberal state, right? They're all like, you know, Flinty, New England, or it's my family, right? And I, and I get it, but the, it's not like it's, and seeing the response to him, and how they cheered, not at the cheap applause lines that politicians do, not that Pete has many of them, but how they cheered it when he talked about unity. How they cheered when he talked about bringing people together. How they cheered about him saying, when I'm president, your blood pressure will go down, right? <laughs> and, and, and I remember in that moment, looking around that room, because New Hampshire voters are tough customers, and, and it's a very different message from sometimes what Iowa voters respond to, and at that moment, I was like, wow, there is, if we were doing that there, here, and it's all around unity in this, and, and I saw a lot of people in that room who are not, you know, true Democrats, and uh, that was the moment I felt it. Yeah, and I, I cheered up a little bit. I got some goosebumps. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say for me, it, it, it's, it wasn't like we're gonna win, but it's like we could win. And that moment for me was the CNN town hall on March 10th in Austin, Texas. So it was Austin city limits, Liz and I were down there, just a couple other people, and it was an hour, Mayor P. Jake Tapper, yeah. Philly guy, yeah. there you go. Um, but it was, there were Tulsi Gabbard and John Delaney were the other two people that night, and they each had an hour, and then Mayor Pete was lost up. And a CNN producer, after Pete was, was getting off the stage, came up to me and like tapped me on the shoulder and he showed me this iPad. And it was like the first two hours and it was just like a straight line. And then the third hour was just like this like spike. And it was like online engagement and viewership. And he was like, hey man, this is like crazy. And that's kind of when I knew that things were gonna be a little bit different on the campaign. And it was true. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Awesome. So Liz and I will stay up here and just hang out. Um, as long as we can, and look forward to chat with y'all. Thanks again for what you're doing. Appreciate it. Okay.